Let's rewind to the early 1920s. Warren G. Harding is the president, and his administration is about to be rocked by a corruption scandal that would capture the public's imagination for years. Hi everyone, I'm Christopher Hunter. At the heart of this corruption story is oil, specifically the oil at the Teapot Dome Reserve in Wyoming. The government set aside this oil-rich land for national emergencies. At the time, it fell under the control of the Secretary of the Navy. However, Harding's Secretary of the Interior, Albert B. Fall, had other plans in mind. In 1921, he convinced the president to transfer control of these reserves to his office. What did Albert Fall do next? Let's just say he caused one of the biggest political scandals in U.S. history, the Teapot Dome Scandal. Let's dive in. Once he had control of the oil reserves, Albert Fall secretly leased them to two private oil companies without any competitive bidding. In a normal bidding process, Congress and the public are informed about who bid and how much, but not this time. Mammoth Oil, led by Harry Sinclair, and Pan American Petroleum, led by Edward Dehenny, stood to gain hundreds of millions in profits from the deal. So they secretly rewarded Secretary Fall with cash, bonds, and cattle, all likely worth several million dollars today. So the Teapot Dome scandal really has to do with oil that was of vital importance to the U.S. Navy. What happens very often in public scandals is something that is clearly a, a, an important public need becomes corrupted. It's a lesson for us, and it's the reason oversight is important, is that when things, particularly for things that are really high priorities for the government and for the people, um, you have to have watchdogs who are paying attention and making sure that there aren't people like Secretary Fall, who, uh, you know, it was later found accepted bribes uh, so that he could make available these very lucrative oil leases to uh, some people who turned around and, and paid him off. Almost immediately, local newspapers began reporting on the lease deal reaching the attention of Senators John Kendrick of Wyoming, a Democrat, and Senator Robert La Follette of Wisconsin, a Republican. Senator La Follette called on a committee to investigate the oil leases. He urged Senator Thomas Walsh to head the investigation, which was expected to be long and boring. Walsh was the committee's most junior minority member, so it seems he got assigned the grunt work. It was led by not a you know, a, a highly regarded, well-known chairman, you know, person in the majority. No, it was it was led by a very little known senator from Wyoming who was in the minority. His party was not in power. So one of the things that's interesting about this is it proves that you don't have to be sort of in a powerful position to have a powerful impact. It's really about your willingness to put your nose at the grindstone and dig up the facts and then present them compellingly. And he did that. The lesson of this is that uh, uh, the, the, the people we elect to Congress to represent us are there to be our eyes and voice. They're there to look into to the affairs of government and to tell us what they see and to do something about it when they see that things are going wrong. Over the next two years, Walsh led an investigation that went through 6,000 pages of documentation, conducted 84 days of hearings, heard from 144 witnesses, and produced 3,600 pages of transcripts. Remember Secretary Fall? In 1923, he decided to resign from office, but immediately got a job with, you guessed it, oil tycoon Harry Sinclair. The first Senate hearing on the Teapot Dome scandal was held on October 24th, 1923, with Albert Fall as his first witness. He defended leasing the oil fields to private companies by claiming that the move was intended to ready the country for possible war or some other urgent need. Navy Secretary Denby testified next, confirming Mr. Fall's account, but the committee didn't buy their explanation and continued to investigate. The media kept digging too, raising more questions about how Mr. Fall who had been struggling financially, had suddenly acquired his new wealth. The media will uh, tell the story. Sometimes that story gets in the hands of a member of Congress or state legislature, and that really 
triggers more action. So uh, usually it's not a, a member of Congress doesn't just find something out of the blue. Usually they've read about it in the newspaper or they've you know, seen some kind of report. So journalism and, and the media play a really important role. So the media comes at this from two, you know, or, or is part of this process in two ways. One, they often do the initial investigation, uncovering some facts that, you know, suggest that, you know, where there's smoke, there may be fire. And then they will follow up and cover the investigation that, that they've triggered in many ways. Revelations continue to unfold as witnesses came forward and public interest in the investigation skyrocketed. Later, both committee members and the targets of the investigation attempted to use the media to their advantage. Harry Sinclair issued press releases that tried to sway public opinion in his favor, and Senator Walsh and others emphasized the bipartisan nature of the investigation to maintain public trust. The Senate issued subpoenas to compel testimony and obtain documents from government officials and private citizens involved in the scandal. Using subpoenas was essential for gathering evidence and deepening the committee's understanding of the full scope of the wrongdoing. The ultimate impact of the Teapot Dome scandal was significant. Albert Fall became the first U.S. cabinet member to go to prison for corrupt actions taken in office. The oil leases were declared invalid. In addition, the Supreme Court issued the landmark 1927 case McGrain v. Doherty. From the very beginning of our country, uh, it's been recognized that Congress has this duty to conduct oversight, investigate, get to the bottom of things. Because if you don't do that, how can you make good law? You know, you can't write reasonable legislation if you don't know what's going on. But that had never been um, either codified in law or really recognized by the court until the aftermath of the Teapot Dome scandal. Because people who were implicated in this scandal refused to testify before Congress. And Congress pursued uh, its right to gather this information and ultimately sued some of these individuals. And the Supreme Court sided in that case, in, in the most important case, it's called McGrain v. Daugherty. And that's really the case that set the precedent that says that the United States Congress has the right to compel people to testify and provide documents to support its investigations. And the thinking was that people who volunteer information aren't necessarily the most reliable people because somebody who comes forward with information may have an agenda that isn't necessarily about just finding the truth. They might be trying to influence things one way or the other. If Congress has the right to actually force folks to come forward and testify under oath, then um, they're more likely to get all the facts. The investigation also led to a new oversight law. The new law stated that the Treasury Secretary was required to provide tax returns upon a committee's request. Until this law, the President of the United States was the only person authorized to release tax returns. So what are the takeaways? One, the Teapot Dome scandal proved that members of Congress can and should work together across political divides to fight wrongdoing in government. Two, the Teapot Dome scandal is a reminder of the importance of vigilance and transparency in government. Senator Walsh's investigation faced a political minefield, had to fight for information, and took years to complete. But the committee collected the evidence needed to figure out what happened and laid out the facts for the public. Three, the Teapot Dome scandal is also a powerful example of how the Constitution's system of checks and balances works to maintain integrity and accountability. The executive branch's misconduct was investigated and exposed by the legislative branch, while the judicial branch upheld the legislative branch's authority to investigate. The end result was that the congressional oversight effort not only stopped the executive branch's corruption, but also produce policy reforms designed to prevent future problems. Hi, I'm Jim Townsend, director of the Carl Levin Center for Oversight and Democracy at Wayne State University Law School. Thank you for watching this episode of Portraits and Oversight, which details one of Congress's most important powers, the ability to investigate abuses that threaten our democracy. 
We hope you will watch additional versions of Portraits and Oversight, and we hope you'll visit our website and social media for additional content from our civic education program, Learning by Hearings. Our educational resources are available to you at no cost through a partnership with the Michigan Department of Education and the State of Michigan. We hope to see you next time. Thank you.